Good morning. My name is Jay Rosenthal, and I'm the Managing Director of Business of Cannabis. Welcome back to the Business of Cannabis Daily Show for Friday, January 28th. If you like what you see, you can check out the rest of our channel, which is full of our Business of Cannabis archive right here, so please do subscribe. For those of you that are new to Business of Cannabis since 2017, we've highlighted the companies, brands, people, and trends driving the cannabis industry, and that's what we look to do here every day. Following the rundown of the key stories we're following, we'll get to our BFC Live segment, where today we'll be joined by Sarah Gillen. She's the co-founder of Ollie Brands, an edibles manufacturer here in Canada. We'd love to hear from you in the comments, and always feel free to visit us at businessofcannabis.com, as well as through all of our social channels, including Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Insta. A few event-based updates before we get started. March 10th, for our, join us for Business of Cannabis New York Sessions in Brooklyn. The, the topic will be connecting social equity licensees with capital. It's presented by Leafly and Vicente Setterberg. We'll be making an announcement about speakers and program and the agenda coming up next week, so stay tuned for that. April 6th, we will be in Miami for Business of Cannabis Miami, where the topic will be cannabis retail, tech, design, and data, so be sure to check that out as well. All the information is in the description below. For today's stories, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is against legalization because of the smell. Cannabis social equity efforts could do more harm than good in California. And high cannabis taxes are no cause for celebration. For our first story, he says Florida is the freest state, but among the list of freedoms he's against, including reproductive rights and LGBTQ rights, Governor DeSantis is also against cannabis. This according to Florida politics. Quote, what I don't like about it, it is if you go to some of these places that have legalized the stench when you're out there, I mean, it smells so putrid. That's from Ron DeSantis. So what's at stake? Well, Ron DeSantis is up for re-election in uh, next year. The Agricultural Commission, Nikki Freed, U.S. Representative Charlie Crist, and State Senator Annette Taddeo are campaigning to beat DeSantis in 2022. All three Democrats have committed to legalizing adult use cannabis in the state. And according to Headset, the Florida cannabis market could be worth as much as $3.2 billion if adult use reform was implemented. Now, medical sales already are $1.3 billion from last year. And a 2019 University of Florida poll showed most Floridians support legalization, including my brother who lives in, in Delray, Florida. While DeSantis has a good shot at winning so far, there's plenty of time for debate and screw-ups, and hopefully uh, cannabis might be one of them. The election is scheduled for J uh, November 2022, and DeSantis is also widely considered to be one of the frontrunners or the frontrunner for the Republican side of the presidential ticket in 2024. So keep an eye of what's happening in Florida. For our second story, California's cannabis legalization laws were designed to help the communities that were most harmed by the war on drugs through equity licensing. But for many of those who are eligible, it's been an expensive bureaucratic nightmare. This in a report from the LA Times. The barriers include the highest, the high cost of lawyers and consultants to, to navigate the compliance issues, varying licensing requirements from city to city, county to county that sometimes favor already established cannabis companies. The requirement to secure commercial space before applying for a license, which was so uh, which was so slow, and some business owners have refinanced personal assets just to stay in the game waiting for their licenses. And there's been renewed efforts to assist equity applicants. They've been dogged by the thriving illicit market, lack of regulatory reform, and other issues. For our final story, the recent news that Massachusetts cannabis tax revenues exceeded alcohols in 2021 is not Good news, and it's not a good sign for the industry. This argues Chris Roberts uh, in Forbes. Americans aren't drinking less, he says. Instead, cannabis taxes are just too darn high in most jurisdictions. Now take a look at the numbers. Nearly eight times as many Americans binge drink versus smoke mead once a month. In Massachusetts, the cannabis excise tax is over 10%, where alcohol runs between a few cents to a few bucks, depending on the type of alcohol and the size. Washington state cannabis tax revenues were $473 million in 2020 and, and uh, 220, that, that's $229 million more than that of liquor, according to the state treasurer. In California, $405 million came in through booze taxes in 2020 and 2021, while cannabis taxes bought in a staggering $1 billion. Here's a quote. The idea that marijuana legalization is leading Americans to drink less sounds nice, but simply isn't borne out by data. This according 
to the article in Forbes. Instead, cannabis taxes are just too high, and that hurts businesses. And we cover all of these things. It's maybe the third story we've talked about this week related to cannabis taxes uh, uh, being more for cannabis than for alcohol. Those are the stories we're watching today. Join 10,000 others and catch all of these stories and more in your inbox every day at 7 a.m. with our Cannabis Daily Newsletter. You can sign up on our website, businessofcannabis.com. Coming up on B of C Live, a conversation with Sarah Gillen. She's the co-founder of Ollie Brands, a cannabis edibles manufacturer in Ontario. Ollie Brands have focused on quality ingredients, unique flavor profiles for their portfolio of products. We connected with Gillen this week uh, as they launched their sugar-free offerings that are hitting the market in Ontario uh, through the Ontario Cannabis Store and through cannabis retailers throughout Ontario. Here's this conversation with Sarah Gillen. Hey, Sarah, thanks for being here. Hi, Jay. Thanks for I having I have a confession to make. Well, it's a confession if I'm confessing. To you, I'm just, uh, I'm really not blowing smoke, but like, I really do like Ollie edibles. There, I said it. <laughs> well, thank you. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Good. That's a good thing. Um, uh, specifically, I was telling you before we came on, the caramels are like, mm -hmm. I just think they are unique in the market. They are delicious. They are effective. They're fun to share because there's like four in a pack. Like, yeah, it's like I, maybe let's start there. Like how much goes, uh, how much of the emphasis of the team goes into obviously the flavor, the ingredients and what you're putting out, how much into the dosage and the shareability and like the packaging, like talk a little bit about sort of how you think about those things. Then we'll get into more detail. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I have to admit, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but the caramels are one of my favorites as well. They're just so melty and so yummy and so indulgent. And there's four per pack, so they're perfect for sharing. They're mild, they're really tasty. So I'm happy to hear you like them too. I, um, I, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was, just, I was just going to answer your question. The company, like just to take it way back. So, you know, my business partner, John Aird. So we founded the company like over a meal with a bunch of friends and the sort of, obviously our goal was to create delicious edibles, but we really wanted to, also have this kind of lifestyle around edibles and, and share edibles with our friends. And we wanted to, we were inspired to create products that were as delicious as like they were, we were proud to share with our friends. So when you speak to sort of the four pack and being able to share it with your friends and, and having a, a good time together, I think that really speaks to, to our brand and like the inclusive nature and, and sort of what we set out to do from the beginning. And that was like to create delicious edibles, to share with friends and family and, and whatnot. So I think a lot of thought goes into I mean, we're edibles focused, so we only manufacture edibles. Um, so, you know, a lot of thought and, and energy and um, strategy goes into our product mix and our product ingredients. And we really want to focus on quality um, and really set the bar in terms of like set the bar really high in terms of um, quality product and quality edibles. And I think you're doing that. And I, 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 I envision like a boardroom with like a huge whiteboard and you plot every edible on the market and you say, where are the gaps and where can we fill? Like, mm -hmm. which brings me to the question, like you're launching new products this week. Like, mm -hmm. is that part of the process where it's like, you like what you like and you have sort of the, the food people with you to like figure out what, what's going to work? Like, or is it a little bit of all that? Yeah, I think it's, it's a lot of, it's a bit of everything. Like we look to obviously edibles market in Canada and also in the U S and I think we also bring in sort of the CPG aspect, like what are trending flavors and trending products in, in sort of mainstream channels. I think also like, um, you know, we look to mainstream products, like one of our products, um, our brownie, it's comes in two per pack. It's a small, um, kind of two bite brownie. Um, but that's something that was, you know, obviously successful in the legacy market. I think many people have tried to make their own at home unsuccessfully perhaps. Um, but I think, you know, when we we're conceptualizing that product, it was a familiar product, not only in sort of mainstream, like everyday uh, desserts, but also in the cannabis world too, it was quite successful. So, so when we were conceptualizing our, our first product for um, our baked good launch, obviously brownie was sort of top the list there. Okay. So, th so we talked a little bit about the products. Tell a little, a little bit about the facility because like, to me, I'm hearing all the flavors and the ingredients and like, does it smell as good as all those ingredients make it sound to be like, does it smell like a, like a delicious bakery with like butter and chocolate, like all the time? 
It's funny, yeah, pretty much. Uh, it either smells like brownies or cookies or delicious melting melting sweet butter. It's like very, very um, yummy. It's hard to um, sort of uh, control my appetite when I'm over there, but um, it's, it's you know, it's we have 25,000 square feet of, of manufacturing space. We're located on the west end of Toronto, um, just uh, sort of just on bordering Etobicoke on North Queen Street there. Um, and we, yeah, we're dedicated exclusively to to cannabis edibles. So we have a team of very passionate product people um, creating the delicious products that we make. Yeah. T talk a bit about, because um, I, I think I just saw that there's, you, you're launching sugar-free um, edibles this week. Mm -hmm. And like, is that a bit about things you want to be putting out? Again, we're talking about sort of the combination of like things you want to be putting out, gaps in the market, what consumers are asking for. Is it a little bit of like all three of those things? Yeah, exactly that. <clears throat> I think that, you know, sugar-free for us was important as an edibles house. We want to be able to respond to um, as many dietary preferences or restrictions as we can. So, you know, in talking to our consumers and talking to our retail partners, we saw that there was a demand for sugar-free products. So exactly, we responded to that and, and we launched um, our sugar-free gems, which are a four pack. And we most recently launched a sugar-free CBN product, which is perfect for for just before bed. And as well, we were just chatting about our lozenges. So we have um, a 10 pack of sugar-free uh, high CBD lozenges as well. Those are delicious. Mm. <laughs> I can attest to that. Yes. Um, and, and great to have. Um, and, and I guess like I, flour still rules, right? It's 50% plus the market, you know, yeah. pre-rolls are like another 20%. Like it's, it's wild, but while there's great genetics and all interesting things and in, in happening on that side of the business too, to me, like there seems to be just tons of innovation coming from you guys and a few others about mm -hmm. like what the edibles world will look like in the future. And I, I think there will always be, you know, traditional gummies, high sugar, like kid-like flavors. Don't tell Health Canada, but like super sugary flavors. And then there will yeah. be like adult and varied products too. Like, is that yeah. how you sort of view the future of the edibles part of the market? Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think we, we can't deny that gummies are such a big portion of the edibles market for sure. I mean, there's yummy, delicious gummies. I think that there's there's lots of great brands doing awesome things there and Ollie does as well. Um, but I think for us also, what's important is to innovate in other categories. I think there's some, um, you know, it would be great to see by end of this year, some of the smaller categories gaining more market share. Like we were talking about the care melts, for example, I really believe in, I know this is a very successful um, product down in Colorado, for example. And I really believe that, you know, I love our product and there's some cool um, other brands coming on the market in that world. Um, but I think, you know, care melts or hard candies or sugar free or even baked goods for that matter. But I think by end of this year, it would be really great to see some of those more smaller um, categories really expand and gain market share. Yeah. And like, you, then, then your mind sort of goes wild. And, and I guess, like, how are, you, how are you finding sort of the regulatory landscape overlaid on like all the innovative things you want to do, plus the marketing challenges? Like, are, are, maybe, the, maybe I'll reframe the question. Is it getting easier to operate for companies like you because now you know how to operate and you have you know years plus under your belt yeah i don't know if i would use the word easy <laughs> um easier but, maybe <laughs> yeah i mean maybe like i think that you know we all are playing by the same rules here and we all are you know i think there's a lot of great brands putting out great product and we all aim to um, promote responsible and safe and trusted cannabis use, whether it be edibles, whether it be flour or, um, you know, any other category beverages, whatever it is. Um, so I think, you know, there are, of course, challenges, but I think we all strive and particularly at Ollie, we aim to, um, you know, do the best we can within the regulations um, and follow them as close as we can, of course. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that um, you, uh, I think as you launched new products, you, you went to some of your sort of retailers to sort of mm -hmm. see how they are like, what are you hearing back from retailers about the products you're putting in the marketplace? Like, are they like, great, now we have something like this to be able to offer to our customers. Like talk a little bit about that relationship and how important it is, but also like how they're finding the products. Yeah, I think that for Ollie, um, because we're a dedicated edibles company, I think for us, quality is number one and we really strive to put the best products out there. So 
we, and truthfully, we're getting that feedback from the market. A lot of our retailers love our products. They love that we're kind of a one-stop shop for edibles. You know, you can get your baked goods, you can get your caramels, your gummies, your hard candies. I think that that is, tells a really interesting story and it speaks to, um, you know, our passion, our dedication for, for edible uh, products specifically. So, you know, I think that um, particularly for the retail environment, it's, it's been really challenging, of course, you know, in and out of lockdowns and sort of the uncertainty of, of, of what's going on out, out in the world. Um, so I think that as an LP, as much as we can do to support various retailers and communicate with them and, and help them uh, succeed in also a very competitive uh, market too, um, I think is really important for us as well. Well, you just described our little edibles drawer, the baked goods, the hard candies, the gummies, the caramels. That's like, yeah, yeah. We, I thought you were just running down a checklist of what's like in my sock drawer. Um, um, Sarah, I really, congratulations on, on sort of the rollout of the new products, of the success and for making um, the caramels. I mean, not to go back to that, but I do, I think it's such a cool product. Um, congratulations to you and the team. And we look forward to connecting with you down the road and um, good luck with the launch of the new products this week. Thanks, Jay. And thanks so much for having me. You got it. That was episode 18 of Cannabis Daily Show. Thank you for joining us this week on YouTube. And please do subscribe. Have a safe weekend. And we will see you right back here on Monday.